I'd like to begin this evening with two Old Testament readings, which are not in the lectionary. So if you come to even daily Mass, you will never hear these in the liturgy. Of course, if you read straight through in the Torah, you would hear them, or if you listen to the Bible in a year, Father Mike Schmidt, you'll hear them. But for some reason, these are not in the liturgy itself. The first reading is from the book of Exodus. You shall make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be its length, a cubit its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold around it. And you shall make around it a frame, a handbreadth wide, and a molding of gold around the frame. And you shall make for it four rings of gold and fasten the rings to the four corners at its four legs. Close to the frame the rings shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and over, overlay them with gold, and the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense, and its flagons and bowls with which to pour libations. Of pure gold you shall make them. And you shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me always. And from the book of Levitic, Leviticus. And you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes of it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, upon the table of pure gold. And you shall put pure frankincense with each row that it may go with the bread as a memorial portion to be offered by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall set it in order before the Lord continually on behalf of the people of Israel as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place, since it is for him a most holy portion out of the offerings by fire to the Lord a perpetual dew. The word of the Lord. In the Old Testament, the religious practice, the worship that the people of Israel offered to God centered around the tabernacle, often translated in English as the meeting tent. It was a tent, but it was a really a of a mobile temple that God had Moses build. He had revealed to Moses a vision of heaven and said to build the tabernacle based on the vision. And so in this tabernacle, there were three most sacred objects. In the innermost sanctuary called the Holy of Holies, there was one thing. There was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was a special box made out of acacia wood, same kind of wood we just heard about. And it was covered inside and outside with pure gold. The rings with which the poles that, carry, that was carried with, they were made out of gold. The acacia poles were covered with gold. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were uh, two cherubim made out of beaten gold. So two angels with their wings outstretched. And below them was something called the mercy seat. And this was seen as the location, the, the, the special place of God's presence with his people, this Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant, God had commanded Moses to place three things. He was to place the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the law of God written on stone. And then he was to place also there the rod of Aaron. Now there were some priests that challenged, or some men who challenged Aaron's right to be the priest. And so God had said all of those men and Aaron were to place their rods before the ark. And in the morning when they came back, the rod of Aaron had flowered, had blossomed, not only with blossoms, but had almonds were growing on it. 
And so this was a sign that Aaron was the chosen priest. And so that rod of Aaron that had blossomed was put into the Ark of the Covenant. And the third thing placed in the Ark of the Covenant was a jar of the manna, the bread from heaven. Now, outside of the Holy of Holies, there was, or there was a, a heavy curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the place just outside, which is called the Holy Place. And in the Holy Place, there were two things. There was a golden lampstand with seven lamps. This is called the menorah. And this, the priests were to keep those seven lamps burning at all times, 24-7. They were always to keep the lamps burning. Now, the menorah is still the main symbol of Judaism to this day. Now, this is on one side of the, the holy place. Opposite to it um, was this golden altar table that we heard about in our reading. Again, it's a table made out of acacia wood, covered, in, or covered completely in pure gold, the, Handles by which it was carried were made out of pure gold, and this also was there in the holy place. Now, all three of these were made at God's command to Moses after the pattern that he had seen on Mount Sinai. They were patterned on heavenly realities. Now, what was this bread of the presence that was placed on this altar table? Now, in many of our English translations, it's translated as showbread, but that doesn't really mean anything, and it doesn't translate um, the, what the Hebrew says. Sometimes it's referred to as holy bread, but the Hebrew name literally means the bread of the face, the bread of the face of God, or alternately, you could say the bread of the presence of God. And so I'm going to use that term, the bread of the presence. So God had every Sabbath, Aaron the high priest was to bring 12 fresh baked loaves. He was to offer them to before God and place them in two rows on that golden table. And with it were to be placed gold uh, flagons, pitchers, and bowls for pouring out libations of wine were placed on the altar. And frankincense, which is still used as incense today, even in the church, we use frankincense as one of our types of incense. Um, frankincense was placed on the altar as well. And this, these 12 loaves of bread with the, the wine and with the frankincense were a sign of the everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant between God and his people. Now, after sitting on that golden altar table for a week, it would be removed. And the, the uh, high priest would again offer 12 fresh loaves and place them in their place. What would they do with the old loaves? They would be taken to the side and the priests would eat them in a holy place as a sacred meal. So this bread of the presence was both a sacrifice offered to God and a sacred meal of the bread and wine of the presence. So again, the menorah was there in the holy place, kept lit near it at all times. Just as in our churches, we have a tabernacle light that is kept by the tabernacle, by the blessed sacrament. The ancient Jews saw their tabernacle as the visible sign of the invisible heavenly dwelling place of God, and they saw the earthly bread of the presence as the visible sign of the invisible face of God. This bread of the presence was also a memorial of a heavenly banquet that we hear about in the book of Exodus. God had Moses and Aaron with 70 elders of Israel go up the mountain, up Mount Sinai. And there, it, it says, in a lot of our translations, our, a lot of our translations are very flawed. It says, um, they saw the face of God and these 
these Israelites were still able to eat and drink. Like, God didn't kill them, basically, is what it sounds like. But that's not what it actually says. What it actually says is they saw the face of God and ate and drank. They shared a heavenly banquet on Mount Sinai. They saw the face of God and shared in this heavenly banquet. And this bread of the presence was seen as a memorial of that very special event. In the religion of Israel, there were many sacrifices, bloody sacrifices where bulls, calves, sheep, goat, doves were offered up, were slain and were offered up to God. Um, but there were also unbloody sacrifices. People would bring the first fruits of their grain, their wine, their grapes, their olive oil. Well, the bread of the presence was the chief of all the unbloody sacrifices of the people of Israel. It is called a most holy sacrifice. And again, was offered once a week on the Sabbath only by the high priest. Now, all this we can find in the Torah, in sacred, in sacred scripture, the first five books of the Bible. But we can look deeper into Jewish tradition and learn more about the bread of the presence. In the book of Genesis, chapter 14, a mysterious figure shows up, and his name is Melchizedek. Now, let's back up and talk about how he showed up, what happened. So there, were, there was a little war between the five evil cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, and their allied cities, and four other kings. And these other kings were victorious, and they were taking off a lot of people, a lot of booty, into slavery, um, and Abraham took off after them and made war on them. Now, why did Abraham intervene? Because his nephew Lot was being taken into slavery. And so Abraham gathers all the men of his household, and it's interesting, Scripture actually says it was 318 men. I mean, that precise, this is not just some, you know, oh, around 300. It's very, very precise. Um, and he gathers all the men of his household, he goes and ambushes these victorious kings, and he's bringing Lot and all the other captives and all the booty back. And as he's coming back, he comes near a city called Salem. And Melchizedek, who is called priest of God Most High, comes out of Salem, comes out of the city of Salem to meet Abraham. And Abraham gives a tithe, 10% of everything he'd won in the battle, to Melchizedek. Now this is significant. When a, when a person gives a tithe to another person, they're saying this other person is greater than them. So Abraham, who has been promised that through his descendants, all the world is going to be blessed, gives a tithe to Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek offered a sacrifice of bread and wine. It just, it says he, he brought out, he offered bread and wine. And he, we might read that superficially and say, oh, he came out and he offered Abraham lunch. That's not what it was. The context here is this is a sacrifice that Melchizedek offered. He's priest of God Most High and he offered bread and wine. Now, Jewish tradition held that Melchizedek was none other than Shem, the oldest son of Noah. Now, we can let that sink in a little bit. And if you go back through the genealogies and how long it says each person lived, not only would Shem have still been alive at the time of Abraham, but he would have outlived Abraham. So he is Abraham's, you know, like 10 or 12 great-grandfather, Abraham's a descendant of Shem, but he's still there and he's ruling the city of Salem, which is the site much later of a city called Jerusalem. Melchizedek is his royal title 
It means king of righteousness or king of peace. And he is called a Cohen. Cohen is a priest. By the way, if you ever um, meet a Jewish person and their name is Cohen, that means they are a priest. Now, in Jewish society to this day, they don't have a temple, and so the priests don't offer sacrifice. In fact, the priests have no role in Judaism, in any special role any longer. But if you were to go to a synagogue on the Sabbath, and um, right before the end of the the ceremony of of the worship, if you saw a couple men get up and walk out, it wouldn't because they're like just trying to beat the crowd out like some Catholics do. When there's a few men who walk out, it's because their last name is Cohen. They're priests. And the rabbi, who is technically a layman, cannot give a blessing if a priest is there. So they leave so the rabbi can give a blessing over the people. So Melchizedek is called a Cohen. He's a priest. And yet he's not of the Levitical priesthood. That didn't even come into existence until hundreds of years later. About 400 years after the death of Levi was when Aaron and his sons became the first Levitical priests. And he offers a sacrifice of bread and wine. This is seen as a true sacrifice offered to God. An ancient rabbi named Samuel ben Naaman said, Melchizedek instructed Abraham in the laws of the priesthood, bread alluding to the bread of the presence and wine to libations. The Jewish people believed that the bread and wine of the presence that was there in the temple and before that in the tabernacle was the primordial sacrifice offered by Melchizedek and given to Abraham. In other words, this is a sacrifice that predates the people of Israel. It came from Melchizedek to Abraham, passed down the generations, and then entered into the Mosaic Law. Now, this bread of the presence was seen as a sacred and miraculous bread. Before being offered in sacrifice, it was prepared and laid out on what to them was an ordinary marble table. Most of us would not consider marble table to be ordinary, but the Jews did. But after offered by the high priest, it's placed on the golden altar. And when removed, it's taken and laid on a golden table before being consumed by the priests. They would not lay what was sacred on an ordinary table. The same kind of thing happens with us when we purify the sacred vessels at the altar or at a consecrated table after Mass, at the end of Mass or before Mass concludes. We don't just take the vessels and set them on any old table uh, unpurified like they don't matter. Okay, This is already the sense of the sacred was already present in Judaism. And there was a tradition that at certain times, um, especially during a a certain high priesthood, a tiny piece of the bread of the presence, a piece the size of an olive, was enough to fully sustain the priests for all their work in the temple throughout the day. In other words, the priests would, the only thing they would eat in the entire day of offering sacrifices was a tiny piece of the bread of the presence, the size of an olive. This is kind of foreshadowing of those saints who lived only on the Holy Eucharist. And the men of Israel were commanded in the law, in the book of Exodus, to go three times each year to visit the tabernacle to see the face of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. How could they go and see the face of the God of Israel, God who is invisible? Well, on those three great, the three great pilgrimage feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booze, when the Jewish people, pilgrims, came to Jerusalem, the priests would come out of the temple carrying the, the table, the altar with the bread of the presence on it. They would elevate the altar 
and proclaim, Behold God's love for you. Behold God's love for you. They saw this bread of the presence as the sign of the covenant, the sign of God's love for his people. It was a visible sign of the divine bridegroom's love for his bride Israel. Now, does our Lord Jesus speak about the bread of the presence in the Gospels? He does. In Matthew chapter 12, but it's a passage that we hear once in a while and it oftentimes goes right past us. The Pharisees questioned Jesus about why his disciples were plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath. And our Lord gave a threefold response. He says, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. What is our Lord saying? First of all, he's saying David ate the bread of the presence. Now, how was David allowed to eat the bread of the presence? Only the priests would eat the bread of the presence. Well, in the passage where this happened, the priest had asked David, Have you and the men with you abstained from being with women? So they were ritually sexually pure. Ritual purity. Not that anything being with the wife makes a man actually impure. It's a ritual thing. So there was this state of ritual purity, of abstinence. But another thing we miss, David was anointed as king. We know that. But David was also a priest. David was not a Levitical priest. He was not of the tribe of Levi. He was not of the line of Aaron. Yet David is described in Scripture as acting as a priest. He wore the linen ephod, the vestment of a priest. He offered sacrifices to God. And even his sons are called priests in in several passages in 2 Samuel. In Psalm 110, David, speaking to his descendant, the Messiah, says, You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Our Lord Jesus, like David, his ancestor, is a priest forever. Jesus is pointing out, David ate the bread of the presence. I am the descendant of David. I am the priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This implies that our Lord's sacrifice would be that of Melchizedek, a sacrifice where bread and wine are offered to God in sacrifice. Now, we know they don't simply remain bread and wine. They become, by the words of the Lord, the body and blood of Christ. Now, that's the first part of our Lord's answer to the Pharisees. The second part is Jesus says the priests in the temple work on the Sabbath and they have no guilt. So Jesus and his disciples have the same privilege because they're also priests. And our Lord finally identifies himself as greater than the temple. Now we hear this, it goes right by us. But you think like a Jew. Think like a first century Jew. And somebody says... I am something greater than the temple is here. I am greater than the temple, he says. What could be greater than the temple? The house of God. The dwelling place of God on earth. Only God himself. Jesus is saying he is the very presence of God on earth. In the Last Supper, Our Lord Jesus took bread and wine, declared it to be his body and blood. We might say, well, why why bread and wine? Why not use the roasted, roasted flesh of a lamb? Well, as we've talked about, Jesus is the true Passover lamb. Could it confuse things if he picks up the roasted flesh of a lamb and says, this is my flesh and my blood? 
But the Jewish people were familiar with the idea that bread and wine could be used to signify God's presence and love for his people. They saw it in the bread of the presence, in the bread of the face of God. Three times a year, shown to them by the priests, behold God's love for you. If we think like first century Jews, it all makes perfect sense why Jesus would have used bread and wine to signify and to actually bring about his presence among us. The Last Supper was the institution of the most sacred sacrifice, meal, and presence of God in our midst. The Holy Eucharist, I remember here in the seminary, they explained it this way. The Holy Eucharist is a sacrifice sacrament in the Mass, the sacrifice of the Mass. It is a communion sacrament. sacrament. We receive him in Holy Communion. And it is a presence sacrament. It is sacrifice and meal, sacred meal, not like lunch. Sacred meal with God and presence of God in our midst. It is at one and the same time the new Passover, the new manna, and the new bread and wine of the presence of God. In the Holy Eucharist, all three of these Old Testament foreshadowings are brought together and brought to the fulfillment. And through this new bread of the presence, Jesus continues in our midst to this very day and will do so until the end of time. The Jewish rabbis, there was a Jewish rabbi who said that in the time of the Messiah, all the sacrifices would cease except for the bread of the presence. Forty years or so after our Lord died and rose from the dead, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, completely leveled to the ground and burned by the Romans. And the Jews have never had a temple since, and they have never offered any of the other sacrifices. But the bread of the presence continues in its fulfillment in the Holy Eucharist. The Holy Eucharist is God's love for us. As I mentioned the other night, in adoration, when we have our Lord in the monstrance, it is a continuation of that moment of the showing of the body of Christ after the consecration. So when the Holy Eucharist, when the sacred host is elevated for us to look and adore, and by the way, we're supposed to look and adore. I sometimes see people put their head down. So the church says to Father, after the consecration, to hold the body of Christ up, to show it to the people. And then I see people refusing to look. The whole purpose is to, for you to look and adore, feast your eyes on your divine Savior. And open your heart in love for him. That's why that action exists. Is so we will adore him. But when the sacred host is elevated, it is as if, with body language, because we're not supposed to say anything, but it is as if we're saying, behold God's love for you. And when the sacred chalice with the precious blood is elevated, shown to us, it's as if the priest is saying, behold God's love for you, which was poured out on the cross. My brothers and sisters, this moment of our Lord being shown to us for us to look and adore, feast our eyes upon him, continues in Eucharistic adoration. Now, as I've said, it is a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing, a great blessing. You can come into the church any time it is open and spend time with your divine Lord. And he is as equally present in the tabernacle as he is in the monsters. There's zero difference, except... It's easier for us with our senses, our eyes, to look and adore when we see him in the monsters. That is what's so special about Eucharistic adoration. Our senses are more actively involved in the reality of seeing the Lord 
hidden under the appearance of the bread, but looking upon our Lord. In your parish, over at St. Athanasius, our Lord is exposed in the Eucharistic adoration on Wednesdays. You have 9 a.m. Mass, after Mass, until 1 o'clock. So three hours or so, our Lord is there, exposed for you to come and look and adore. Here on Thursdays, you have Mass at noon. After Mass ends until 6 p.m., our Lord is here, exposed in the monstrance for you to look and adore. There is tremendous grace, my brothers and sisters, in coming before our Lord, in spending time with Him, looking upon Him, making acts of faith and hope and love. We are in the presence of of God himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. This is the total fulfillment of that ancient bread of the presence. After the consecration, there is no bread and no wine left. But what we have is the sacred sign and instrument of our Lord's real presence with us until the end of time. It is the sign of the new and eternal covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb. This, my brothers and sisters, is absolute reality. Our Lord is present with us.